number one, Bitcoin ETFs. I know a lot of you have probably heard tons of people talking about how there's so much money that's getting ready to go into them or that's starting to. It's more than you realize, and it's broadening. If you look at this graph right here, you can see grayscale outflows. You can see Bitcoin ETF inflows. They're broadening. It's going higher. It's record-breaking. We're seeing more and more inflows by the day. Uh, Bit BlackRock just broke records again today. So, and yesterday, and <laughs> we have access to boomer funds. I got that little note up here, right? We've got trillions in AUM that boomers have been holding on to. And they've just been looking for a vehicle that can do, a, that can store their value better. I don't know if you guys realize this. This is why we do this. This is what that video just talked about. We, we try and find things that can help our money, that can preserve our wealth or turn it into more. That is what this entire investing thing is. This is why people buy rental properties. This is why people buy real estate. This is why people buy bonds. This is why people buy gold. This is why people buy commodities that they don't directly need. It's to preserve wealth and to try and build it against a machine that is constantly trying to feed on it. It's very important that you understand this. All right, next one here. I got to line these up better. Brazil, South Korea, Hong Kong are all firing up ETFs. All of them. Brazil's doing it right now, then probably South Korea, then Hong Kong over the summer. The inflows in the pipeline that are heading into Bitcoin right now are like nothing we've ever seen. Ever. States are looking to buy Bitcoin for the retirement funds. This will happen with all of them. All of them will start doing this over time. The numbers will just grow. We have the Bitcoin halving in 42 days. In 42 days, the Bitcoin network will be producing half of the new supply of what it is today. That's an incredibly important thing to understand. So right now, we have like BlackRock and, and these other ETFs consuming Bitcoin at a rate of 10 to 15 times the new daily supply. Right now. After the halving, if the price didn't change, that will be 20 to 30 days. 20 to 30 days, if it's 30 days, that means that three days is three months. 12 days is a year. And then every four years, the, the new issuance gets cut in half. These are insane numbers. You have to understand this. Also, at the halving, people don't realize this. Miners stop selling. Everyone stops selling. Nobody sells. It's already happening now. It's happening while we have the biggest inflows ever in the history of Bitcoin. And they're picking up. Lisa, thank you for being a member. We have the FASB accounting rule changes, which allow corporations to hold Bitcoin. And they, it gives them a cleaner incentive to want to do it because they've seen that 35 to 40% of the money that's ever existed in this country's history was printed between the last two administrations in less than four years. Why do you think housing is 35 to 40% more expensive? And that same time, it's because we printed that much money. These FASB rules make it to where corporations, instead of watching their money bleed away because it's sitting on their balance sheet or having to do stock buybacks or whatever, there, they can hold Bitcoin, maybe just 2 3% allocation. And if they do that, they can the money printer can increase their balance sheet. That's such an important thing. If you're an accountant, anything, that's such an important thing. Here's, the, here's a comparison between gold. I don't know if you can see gold. It's a, it's a dark chart. It's way down here. This is since 2023. Bitcoin's performance versus gold. Gold up 19%. Bitcoin up 300% or something. 232% more for Bitcoin. Which asset is the better store of value? OT, OTC desk. This is over-the-counter trading. This is where the exchanges, this is where people buy big blocks. They, this is where they buy and sell, right? 
they're running dry. And yes, this isn't all accountable. There's still some out there. But this shows how, for years, they're running dry. They're running out. They're running out at a time when our banking sector has never been in more peril. And that's important. Exchange balances have been dropping since 2020, since the pandemic. When we started having bank-related issues. The big dogs, they're saying, I want stuff in a hardware wallet. I want it off exchange. I want it hidden. I, let's do cold storage. I, I want this stuff away. because I want, And I want to make sure I'm the only person that has access to it. So you have OTC desks. They don't have Bitcoin anymore. They're running out. You have balances, the balances on exchange are running out because people aren't keeping their Bitcoin on there anymore. After all the banks started to fail, after FTX collapsed, after Silvergate, after Voyager, after Luna, after all these things in crypto blew up over the last year and a half, people are running away from leaving these things on exchanges. And they don't trust banks as much anymore either. I mean, again, New York Community Bank is collapsing right now. We're watching it in real time. So you have way less supply available, way less than we've ever seen before in the history of Bitcoin at a time when we've never had greater inflows happening and becoming more available. The pipe is broadening. Sorry, this isn't much of a market recap, but this is what you need to know right now. All the other stuff is fucking noise. The BTFP, the buy the fucking dip is what people called it, but it's the bank term funding program, ends this month in five days. This is a big deal. This is probably why we're seeing NYCB get wrecked and we'll see more banks potentially get wrecked is because they can't, they can't get borrow from this anymore and be hidden and invisible. They'll have to go to the discount window and they'll have to say, hey, we need to borrow money. We're really effed. And then that causes bank runs. It just causes a lot more stress. A lot more stress. And that's happening here in five days. Not that many banks have been going there anymore. But they have stealth liquidity in the reverse repo markets. So these repo markets, you can see how we had all this liquidity and it's been bleeding down. So even though the Fed has been tightening, quote unquote, and removing their balance sheet... With the re reverse repo markets getting drained by banks, you still have liquidity coming into the system. But that's going away. So what happens when liquidity goes away, the bank term funding program goes away, and you have banks like New York Community Bank already failing? And soon, probably more to come. Did you know that Larry Fink from BlackRock... This guy right here, look at this. BlackRock bought 12,447 Bitcoin yesterday. That's 14x the daily supply. That's cool. Very interesting things here. Did you know that Larry, again, BlackRock, in case you don't know this, is the largest, they hold the largest holdings of any assets under custody of an investment firm on the planet. Like 12 trillion or something. I don't know what the exact figure is anymore. It's probably fluctuated, but around that. Let's say a lot of trillions, right? He called Bitcoin gold 2.0 and he said it was a flight to safety during turbulent times. Ah, oh, I don't know how much signal people need to understand what's coming. Not only that, but you have so you have banks under stress, right? What's the, what's the what's the Fed going to be able to do to fix that? They got to lower rates. They got to lower rates so that they can open up the markets to lending, so that banks are able to lend so that loans can be done, so that they can start increasing revenues, so that they can help them with the bonds that they're holding that they've been devastated by over the last year and a half. These banks that thought they were being safe by buying bonds, buying the wrong terms for them, and then getting utterly destroyed. That's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. Sure, there was some mismanagement there, but banks are illiquid by design. They don't have any money. They take your money and they borrow it out. They're fractional reserve, which means they have a fraction of what they're supposed to. Can you imagine, like, did you know that some of your banks are like have 10% or less of the money? It's very important to understand these things, that banks by design don't have money. You've got to understand that. 
and then we're putting tons of pressure on them. What are we going to do, though? We're going to release the valve. We're going to lower rates so that we can try and save the economy, so that we can fire up the auto sector, so that we can fire up the real estate market again, so that we can get people borrowing, so that we can get them better rates to where they don't plummet and fall into financial catastrophe and we don't see bankruptcies all over the place. I'm a little fired up today, but like, isn't that every day really? All right, 35 to 40% of the money that's ever existed was created in the last four years. Again, I just said this, but just visually look at it. This is the M1 money supply. Does anything look strange here? And I think this one, it says by this administration, to be very clear, it was both administrations. Both suck. They suck. They fight back and forth about crap. They tell you to look at each other differently and hate each other for different reasons, whether it's the color of your skin, your sexual orientation. I don't care what any of it is. It's all crap. This is your problem. Our money is broken. Stop hating other people because of whatever. It doesn't matter. We need better money. We can't have this. Global liquidity right now is going up. It's going up. We have banks failing, but we have money everywhere. We have 35 to 40% more than we ever had before. We've got housing that's too expensive. How do you fix that? I can tell you, you put the money and the value into the best store of value on the planet that isn't correlated to housing, that doesn't make it to where people can't afford to get homes anymore. You put it in there, and then you save the housing market. And we've got global liquidity everywhere to help push into Bitcoin. Bitcoin could take a percent of everything, a percent of real estate, a percent of gold, a percent of stocks, and it would be a huge number if done over a short enough period of time. you got to realize that. We have the greatest number of elections in history sitting in front of us right now in recent times. There are over 4 billion people voting this year. 60 elections across the, across the world. You know what's going to happen? All of them are going to feed the money printer so that they can keep their jobs. And then you have another billion and a half almost in China where their job, Xi's just trying to stay alive because he's destroying his country. So, so they've got to provide liquidity. He's holding off as much as he can. They're doing it in stealth ways, but they're going to have no choice. Thank you for the tip, Peter. And then you have every other country on earth. You have like five and a half billion people that are seeing the money printer in their country. That seems like a lot. So all these doom and gloomers that say everything's going to fall apart, I don't believe that. And I believe that Bitcoin, I, I believe that we're looking at an investment opportunity that is once in a lifetime. And a bunch of people right now think that it's already coming past. Oh, I, I missed out on Bitcoin, man. Bitcoin is being born right now. Right now. And that's why I'm crazy enough to believe that we're going to 98,000 before the halving. The halving's 42 days away. And I think that. Isn't that insane? How is that remotely possible? How is it possible that we could be going to that number in that period of time? I don't know. Maybe it's everything I just told you. You know, maybe it's everything I just told you. Maybe it's all the ETFs, the ones that are coming and the ones that are already here. Maybe it's the fact that every corporation and state and government on earth has an incentive to invest in Bitcoin right now. Maybe it's the having coming in 42 days. Maybe it's the FASB accounting rules and the, the perpetual money printer that MicroStrategy is creating by selling stock, buying more Bitcoin, which increases the value of their company, and then selling stock and then buying more Bitcoin, which increases the value of their company, thus creating a money printer where his company will just become more valuable, this bull cycle. It's what he does. Or the fact that we're outpacing gold greatly. Or the fact that there's no Bitcoin at OTC desks. Or the fact that there's no Bitcoin on exchanges. Or the fact that we're ending bank term funding programs, which could cause concerns for the banking sector. Or the fact that we're drying up liquidity while seeing banks collapse. 
Wow, Larry Fink. Larry Fink, there's another one on here. I wish I would have grabbed that image. I must have missed it. It's literally him saying, ah, we have 4,400 banks. That's probably too many anyway. Isn't that interesting? We have, but how are they going to save us? They're going to start lowering rates, which you know what it does? It provides more liquidity. At a time where we're seeing more liquidity, where we printed more money. Again, think about the existence of the United States of America, the entire thing. And then realize that over 35 to 40% of the money that's ever existed has just been created in the last half a decade. Less than that. Global liquidity through the roof, voting everywhere, money just everywhere. Yes, I believe this is going to happen. And I believe this is just the start. My target is $280,000. I just hope I can get people to realize that this is your lifeline. This makes the world a better place. If you didn't watch the beginning of this video, watch it. Watch it again and again and again until you understand what it's saying. It doesn't make sense to have a system built off of diluting money away from people and stealing it from them. Can you imagine how much richer? There's something called velocity of money, which is why Keynesian economics exists, right? It says that we need to print a bunch of money to keep money moving, and the money moving will rotate from business to business to business, enriching everyone. I do believe that's true. Crazy, right? I believe that's true. I believe that can be a good thing. But I believe the best long-term solution if you have long vision, is not that. It's allowing scarcity to exist, where you don't rob people of their wealth, where you don't rob generation to generation. You have to have this. You have to be able to give your kids something. It makes the world a better place because then we start planning for generations from now, not just us. If we, if we have the money and the... We're at a time where, like, abundance can just explode. It can explode. We have, we have AI that can help us. It can be, if, watch that video again. It can, even, it can either imprison us or it can free us. This is the precipice that we're on right now. Technology, money, all this stuff. We can make it to where we're more decentralized and autonomous, and these things serve us as tools or we can make them into our rulers. And Bitcoin is one of the things that will set you free. I don't know how to get everybody to understand it, but please try. For your own sake. Now, I don't feel like talking much more. So 